UEFA and the Premier League have been dancing around the financial fair play issue for years. Most fans assume these rules weren't ever going to be enforced. But this season, Everton have been docked 10 points for overspending and Nottingham Forest and Newcastle could be next. Manchester City are also in the FFP crosshairs. This year promises to be a watershed moment off the pitch. Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup, and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about some of the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred, and welcome to the show. One of the rolling themes of the Premier League season so far has been the worldwide discussion about financial fair play, or if you prefer, the rules of profitability and sustainability. The debate applies most obviously and dramatically to Manchester City, so let's begin there. The City saga dates back to nine seasons between the 2009-10 season and the 2017-18 season, and is therefore the longest-running period of alleged breaches in the history of the game. City's alleged malfeasance, therefore, is of a quantitatively different order to what has happened at Everton and Nottingham Forest and what could or might have happened at Chelsea and Newcastle United with their bizarrely profligate spending in the pre-season transfer window. Think of it this way. City is a planet capable of pulling things towards it through its gravitational pull while the other clubs are shooting stars. They might light up the sky. When you next look, they are gone. To recap, a year ago, after a five-year-long investigation, City were accused by the Premier League of 115 violations of financial fair play regulations, dating back 14 years. In the interest of time and brevity, we can't detail all 115 breaches here, but they can be collapsed into the idea that City failed to provide the Premier League with information that, quote, gives a true and fair view of their financial position. Specifically, it is alleged that they failed to provide accurate financial information relating to former coach Roberto Mancini's salary, as well as the salaries of players for a five-year period during which Mancini was coach for some of the time. A year ago, Mancini said that when interviewed, that his city contract was above board and he had paid his taxes. At that point, he did not expect anyone to approach him in connection with the alleged financial fair play breaches, which seems like a slightly strange but entirely predictable answer. In addition to these allegations, the Premier League have also accused City of not cooperating fully with their investigation, which began in 2018. City have not only been economical with the truth, they have been economical with the truth about that truth. This is one slippery case. City have always contested the charges, sometimes vehemently, but will now have an opportunity to disprove them because a date in, quote, late autumn, which in all likelihood means September or October, has been set for City's hearing. This means that the outcome of the current Premier League season will not be affected. Sanction, whatever form it takes, will in all likelihood apply to the season in which the trial takes place and will not be retroactive or retroactively binding. So all those fans of other clubs who are expecting an unexpected foot-up or points windfall, calm down. The hearing is anything but straightforward. This is because it has been widely speculated that Manchester City, in keeping with their traditional high press on such matters, will appeal the decision. Such appeals could take years, so while further witness statements will be garnered through the summer to build a case against them, a decision might not be made until the summer of 2025, in approximately 18 months' time, in other words. To add a little spice to proceedings, this is about when Pep Guardiola's contract comes to an end. The quote late autumn hearing date for City reminds us that they have been in a similar late stage of a Champions League Cup tie before. 
On hearing the news of the date, Alexander Seferin, the president of the Union of European Football Associations, otherwise known as UEFA, told the world's media that he saw the Premier League's charges as a vindication that UEFA's financial misconduct charges against City for a three-year period in 2020 were, quote, right. It was a big thing to say. City challenged those charges, taking the case to the Court for Arbitration in Sport in Switzerland. Cass ruled that UEFA's initial banning of City from the Champions League for two seasons, in addition to a £25 million fine, was procedurally flawed. They argued that their view was that UEFA had failed to prove sufficiently that City's alleged breaches occurred and that some breaches were, quote, time-bound. They substantially reduced City's fine and overturned their European competition banning. After charging City in February 2023, the Premier League's charges against them appeared to lose momentum, due in part, I think, to City's general unhelpfulness and, in a manner of speaking, their parking of the financial bus. The matter between the Premier League and City might have dragged on interminably had it not been for the less complex profitability and sustainability charges against Everton and Nottingham Forest. As these charges were pursued this season, people naturally began to ask why the City matter was dragging on. Not wanting to appear to be inconsistent, the league suddenly got a move on with respect to City. The Everton and Nottingham Forest situations are these. All clubs within the context of the Premier League's profitability and sustainability rules are allowed to spend £105 million in excess of their earnings in any three-year period. In Everton's case, an independent commission found that they had overspent this £105 million excess by £19.5 million. As a result of being found guilty of this flagrant example of loitering financially off sides, Everton were deducted 10 premiership points. The deduction has cost them dearly because they are currently third from bottom and would be relegated if the league were decided now, at the beginning of February. With the 10 points, Everton's season might almost be rosy-cheeked with perkiness and shades of good health. They would probably be in the comfort of mid-table, somewhere between Wolves and Fulham, looking forward to the beginning of the 2024-5 season, where they and their fans believe they rightfully belong, which is of course in the Premiership. Everton have appealed the Independent Commission's first decision, but in the meantime, a second Independent Commission have found that they've again exceeded excess spending by £19.5 million for a second three-year accounting cycle. Before the second commission can finalise its business, however, Everton's appeal to their first sanction must be heard. Only when this is finalised will they make a finding. For their part, Everton will presumably go the double jeopardy route in their appeal or mitigation argument saying that they've already been punished by a 10-point deduction. Is it really necessary to punish them again? Forrest, to the mirth of many, recruited with great and largely misplaced zeal and energy in the pre-season transfer window. Such commitment to expanding their squad and staying up has resulted in them also being in breach of profitability and sustainability rules. Like Everton, they don't deny that they've overspent and, like Everton, they will be contesting whether this takes the form of an appeal or arguments in mitigation. Both the Forest matter and the Everton matter must be wrapped up by the time the Premier League hold their annual general meeting in the English summer. This is because it is at the AGM that next season's 20 Premiership places get decided. So time, in the case of Everton's appeal and Forrest's case, is of the essence. The city matter, meanwhile, is in a completely different quadrant of the regulatory pitch. This one will definitely go into extra time. We might even be witness to penalties and penalties upon that. And who knows what little legal shenanigans 
are going on behind closed doors or in the back of coffee houses in Geneva, Munich and Seville as we speak. Now that a sort of date has been set for cities hearing, lobbying can begin. City own or have investments in 18 clubs across Europe. This is an empire, while Everton, Forest and Newcastle are only clubs. Empires do not traditionally come to the table ready to admit defeat and hand over the keys to the kingdom. When it comes to the 115 breaches, we are in for a very long season. The football world, in fact, is in for a war. If we were being critical, we might say that the Premier League's AGM is the almost perfect definition of a talk shop. Why so? Well, because the Premier League is a members organisation made up of club representatives who tend to see things, understandably, in terms of narrow self-interest. To be clear, narrow self-interest is what is whatever's good for Arsenal, or Liverpool, or Everton or Nottingham Forest for that matter. What is best for the professional game of football in England is secondary to what is good for a club, and blocks of clubs, like the established league founders for example, should it come to that. The problem hasn't gone unnoticed. There has long been talk, again that word, talk, of a statutory body for oversight in English football, a regulator in other words. The matter was raised in the House of Commons in 2023. A white paper was circulated, which should all set our hearts a-racing with little flutters of expectation. The idea here is that there is a need in situations such as these for independent governance. This might take the form of independent directors chaired by a lead independent as part of a Premier League governance overhaul. Such directors would not be affiliated to a club. They would be able, at least theoretically, to make decisions in the best interest of the broader game. It would be their responsibility to keep the broader ambitions of the entire environment uppermost in their minds. Maybe it would take an independent form, that of an independent statutory body adjacent to, or above, the Premier League. On the face of it, this looks unwieldy, expensive, dull. At the same time, it can't have escaped the savvy observer's attention that the Premier League's application of fair play has been ponderous. Some would go further and say it has been unfair. Richard Masters, the chief executive of the Premier League, has received complaint about not reacting fast enough. There have been more general moans from the media and the football-loving public about lack of communication. There are times when the saga with so many moving parts, does seem fiendishly difficult to unravel. It also takes place within different time frames. The City time frame is different to the Everton time frame, for example, which further clouds the issue. Forgive me while I interrupt a sports story to tell you about the Luke Alfred Show Patreon. As you may know, being a writer is not the most lucrative career choice. Please consider making a small donation to keep the show going at patreon.com forward slash the Luke Alfred show. But for now, let's get back to the story. The charges against Manchester City were leveled a year ago, in February 2023. Yet the FA didn't appear to be dealing with the matter with any great urgency. That was until the Everton overspend happened. And that was until Forrest's feeding frenzy. The logic of fair play suddenly seems inexorable. Heads will roll. Although, note the equivocation, perhaps they will only roll back onto the necks and shoulders that supported them. One of the buried assumptions of this week's episode is that we all know what we're talking about when we evoke phrases like FFP and profitability and sustainability rules. It's wrong to assume too much, so let's do a quick trawl through the genesis of the idea. There was once a time, remember, when clubs didn't simply fold, they went belly up. Think of Glasgow Rangers, think of Leeds United, think of Portsmouth, who were high profile and had nine points deducted when they collapsed in February 2010. And let's not forget Queen's Park Rangers and Derby County, 
Luton Town and Southampton, or, for that matter, casting our gaze further afield, have a good look at the travails currently of Barcelona and Juventus. The method of going belly up might have been subtly different each time. It might also have been given a different name. Some called it receivership, others talked of dissolution or voluntary liquidation. The clubs sometimes re-emerged under a different owner or a consortium of owners or an overseas owner. The fact of the matter was that 15 or 20 years ago, this kind of thing happened so often that it began to make important people uncomfortable. The converse of this idea is that football clubs have a remarkable and frankly lovable knack of landing on their feet. They might leak money, true, their grasp of basic financial building blocks might be rudimentary, and there might be better run car boot sales. But soon their sails are reinflated with gusts of hope and healthy optimism. Clubs have been known to come clipping back through the incessant football waves. As part of this story, it's important to know that in 1992, the top flight of English football was rebranded as the Premier League. New digital technologies started becoming available through the 1990s, which meant that cable and satellite TV, encryption and flat panel display spread the rebranded English game to all corners of the world. This included the Middle East, the Far East, the former USSR, North America and Africa. As a result of rebranding and the reach of satellite TV, wealthy, frequently hopelessly vain men were turned on to the Manchester derby or the Liverpool one. They looked at Arsenal or Spurs or Chelsea and they liked what they saw. Once, 130 years ago, it had been a gold rush. Now it was a goals rush. The lust for clubs and goals, goals and clubs, had begun. One of them, Roman Abramovich, started circling over Chelsea owner Ken Bates. Forty years ago, Abramovich would have bought newspapers or media empires, but that was old biscuit, not sufficiently sexy or glamorous enough. Instead, he bought Bates's club from him, once the deal would have been sealed with a good malt whiskey. But, according to authors Simon Cooper and Stefan Zamansky, the two rather shook hands over a bottle of Evian water at a swanky London hotel. Abramovich was a worrying figure with a shady past. Was he villain or saint? Pro-regulation administrators saw him as a character type, the football sugar daddy. They wanted clubs to, this is by now a famous phrase, quote, live within their means, which is the quintessence of fair play and sustainability thinking. They wanted owners to be reputable individuals or groups or consortiums who passed the, quote, fit and proper persons test. They worried that big money would inflect the game away from the middle and make it the playground of the unaccountably super rich. They worried that football clubs would become unmoored from their traditional communities to become free-floating pan-global entities. Their fears seem to have been realized. Under Sheikh Mansour and his Abu Dhabi group, Manchester City have won the league six times in the last ten years and five in the last six. The only exception to that being Liverpool's win of the title in 2019-20, in which City were runners-up. There is another aspect to all of this which, for the sake of simplicity, we can describe as the tension between appearance and reality. Clubs are outward-facing. What happens on the pitch is everything. What competitions teams win, which players play for them, and how they go about winning counts for a great deal. Or does it? What fair play and sustainability rules are really saying is be transparent and, importantly, be congruent in the way that you conduct your business. Let your back end work in the way you'd like the fans to see your team work on the pitch. It's quite clear that Chelsea's recent recruitment is of the try and pin the tail on the donkey while blindfolded type. Nottingham Forest have gone on a recruitment bender. Fahad Mashiri, the Monaco-based British-Iranian businessman 
an owner of Everton, has clearly not put appropriate checks and accounting balances in place at his club. There is the issue of Everton's overreach in the form of their new stadium, and what of money that is or isn't coming from Mashiri's Ukrainian pal Alisha Uzmanov. It's all a bit of a mess, isn't it? Imagine if Everton, Nottingham Forest and Chelsea played football to the standards they bring to the running of their business. They would be utterly unwatchable. Relegation fodder. This, as I see it, is the logical extension of sustainability in FFP rules and regulations. There is a moral imperative here. The imperative says, run your business to the same high standards you aim for and hope to achieve on the pitch. Seen in this way, I don't think that FFP and sustainability and profitability rules are such a bad thing. The only caveat to this is that I, like many of us, get reflexively offended when greeted by paternalistic arguments or interventions. I always curdle inside slightly when I hear about rules and their application that start with the premise that powerful organizations must help people to help themselves because people are unable to help themselves to begin with. In beefing up on my subject for this episode, I've watched a number of informative and detailed podcasts, thank you to The Athletic, and read a good many articles and sections of books. I'm struck in all of this that what we are witnessing in the FFP and sustainability debate is a subtle trick of the light, where what many are talking and writing about stands at a slight angle to matters as they pertain to City. What I'm saying is this. Much news reporting and comment in the long second half of this issue is under the illusion that the City's 115 alleged breaches are about football. They aren't. I beg to differ. In City's case, given their hard tackling on the matter, we are dealing not with football, but with British and European legal and financial real politic. The two stand close in the team photo, but they're different players. I wonder, for example, if there are any Brexit implications in the case, given that Britain was a member of the European Union when many of the breaches were alleged to have taken place, but Britain is a member of the EU no longer. City's lawyers aren't going to bring a two-page argument and a couple of dusty arch-lever files to the hearing. They will bring all the obtuse fine print of contracts they themselves drafted. 115 breaches, can you imagine? They aren't going to spend time in the hearing looking at their feet like scolded schoolboys. They will bring fair means and foul to matters as they unfold in the late autumn. Haven't they already tried to discredit the Premier League appointed barrister because he's an Arsenal supporter? I believe the media ought to know all of this, and some of them do, and some of them are being disingenuous not to tell us that this hearing will dawdle through the months for years. This is not exciting news. We crave closure. The Premier League season opens, proceeds through a drab middle, enlivened slightly by the presence of the January transfer window, and closes. Our Amazon Prime series open and close. Periods of employment open and close. But all these things taken together constitute life, and life tends not to be as clear-cut as a mini-series on Netflix. Finally, I don't believe enough has been made of the comments made by UEFA President Seferin, you might say that this is nothing more than a case of sour Slovenian grapes. Seferin is a Slovenian, by the way, but I think what he said is germane to the city case. He's been UEFA president for going on seven and a half years, so isn't some fly-by-night carpetbagger with a small office above a repair workshop in which you are offered your coffee in polystyrene cups. No, sir. He knows what he's talking about, so when UEFA gunned for City, they knew what they were doing. Or did they? Perhaps City knew better. Whichever way you look at it, profitability and sustainability, once a toothless wonder, is beginning to bite. 
The 10-point deduction from Everton shows that. The January transfer window showed that too. Suddenly, the market was filled with loans and loan recalls, a way of freshening your squad without spending money on anything but additional salaries. The clubs might be wrapping their financial heads around the idea that they can't simply spend money they don't have. It's basic housekeeping about bloody time. If you enjoyed this episode of The Luke Alfred Show, please give me a five-star rating. As an independent creator, this podcast is made possible through your support 